a big fan of all things visual. Uh, first up, we will have Amy Robinson Sterling, who is the executive director of iWire, and she'll tell you more about the details of what iWire does, but she is an expert scientific visualizer, and you'll see how she brings that to you and makes these very complicated data sets really come alive. Then we'll talk to Helena Ledmir, who is the Director of Development and Communications at INCF, which is an international neuroinformatics coordinating facility. And so these are, um, this is a group of people that enables fair and open science focused on neuroscience and disseminating information. So she'll tell us about how important visualization is for communicating with the public and getting your main ideas across. And then we'll talk to Colin Prawl, who is a visual artist based in New York, uh, who has a degree in illustration from the Rhode Island School of Design. And you will see that he has really immersed himself in neuroscience to try to depict in an artistic way, the scope of the visual system and the auditory system. And he'll take us through some of those uh, pieces of art that he's done, which are really impressive. So, you know, you've heard the, um, the aphorism that a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, just for your edification, here are a thousand words, and here is a picture. I personally would rather look at the picture than the thousand words, but you know, of course, they work uh, in complement to each other. And so, when we're doing visualization in many different ways, we take advantage of the human innate visual system, which has evolved to be able to process spatial information in a really effective way and gather information about objects and relationships. And so when you are thinking about how to communicate your science or communicate concepts in general, that's something that you want to think about. Like how do people interpret the visual scene and, and how can you use what we know about vision to, to make things better, to make things engaging, to, to bring people into the subject that you'd like. And so I think this is something that there are a lot of important tools for, and it's a really important skill for you to learn of how to make good figures, how to convey things um, graphically, sometimes interactively with 3D or with video. And so these are very challenging things, but you know we have um, some people here on the panel who can tell us how important that is. And some uh, are able to say how they use the medium of sight to communicate what they, what they think is really fun and important. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop my sharing and I'm going to bring, <clears throat> I'm going to bring Amy um, up on screen. And Amy, will you uh, share your screen for us? Sure. If you're, if you're ready to do that here, we can just pull you up as focus. Now, let me, before Amy begins, I want to emphasize a couple of, uh, a couple of things. First of all, there, we, you see the chat window and everybody's talking, love to see everybody talking. Uh, and we'll try to respond to the things that people are saying there. There's also, uh, you can ask a question and please upvote the questions that you see there because those are the things that we will prioritize for thinking about um, what is it that we're going to, we, part of the discussion. So I'll try to bring them up. And your name should already be on there, but if you want to come on screen to ask your question, you can just say plus screen at the end and I'll happily bring you up and we can have that discussion there. So with that, uh, I'm going to focus <clears throat> Amy's um, presentation up here. And Amy, you want to say hi? Sure. Hello. Uh, I'm Amy Sterling. Uh, okay, just making sure you guys can see my screen okay. Uh, so I'm the director of iWire, which is a citizen science project that's based out of Sebastian Sung's uh, neuroscience lab at Princeton University. Uh, so our lab is focused on kinectomics, which you guys probably know about, but kinectomics is focused on looking uh, and charting out the circuits of neurons. Um, so finding all the synaptic connections uh, and charting the 3D structure of neurons. And in our case, we're uh, using electron microscopy images to uh, generate these really high resolution uh, maps of neurons. And then we team up with electrophysiology labs to uh, combine these reconstructions with um, the 3D models of cells so you can start to actually model the, the activity and, and the computational properties of, of circuits of neurons in the brain. 
And so the part within the lab that I run is called iWire. And it's a citizen science game. We kind of posit it as, you know, we're inviting people from all over the world without a scientific background and with scientific backgrounds, but mostly without to kind of go on this epic quest to chart out undiscovered uh, 3D morphology of neurons. And we, we you know, call them the sort of the heroes of neuroscience um, because they are extending our lab to help us reconstruct all these neurons that would otherwise take thousands of hours of expert human reconstruction time. So I'm gonna jump from my slides straight into iWire because it is a browser-based game. Uh, so this is iWire, for those of you who have not seen it. Um, I'll just say hi, hi all from Neuromatch Visualization Presentation. Uh, so these are the people who have contributed to uh, mapping this and other neurons just today. Uh, so this is a neuron that's come from the mouse retina. Um, we have lots of cells that are online for the player to choose from at a time, but all these little these little planes and glowing spots are actual real players who are working on this cell among many. Um, so they're saying, let's say hello. And the way that the game actually works is you go in and you hit start playing, and it takes you to a, a cube. So this cube is a small volume of brain, about four and a half microns. Uh, and as I'm scrolling through, I'm actually scrolling through a stack of electron microscope images. And what the players are challenged with doing is mapping this little blue thing from one side of the cube to the other. So this little blue thing is a small branch of a neuron. And our machine learning has uh, done partial reconstruction. So this whole this whole cube is a little um, is a little piece of a much larger data set. And every spot in 2D corresponds with a super voxel, an agglomeration of little 3D pixels in 3D. So the players kind of come in, and what they're trying to do is sort of color inside the lines. Um, so some of these cells, you can these gray outlines are actually the cell membranes, the, the boundaries of the edges of neurons. And some of them have a pretty clear outline, whereas others, there's a little, you know, it's not quite as clear. So in this case, if I just make one little click, it's extending this, this branch to the other side of the cube. Um, and I, as a human, can tell that this looks right, well, because I've done this quite a lot, <laughs> but also because the, the joint between these two 3D pieces is, is pretty smooth. Uh, and so if I were to kind of scroll through and find all the missing pieces, that would be great. But in this case, I'm just going to hit submit, and it's going to, I guess, 67 points. It's going to cross-reference what I did with the actions of other highly accurate players who also did the same cube. And if the majority of us map this branch to exit the cube at the same point, then iWire will generate a new cube that starts at the endpoint of the previous cube. So in this way, we go cube by cube by cube, and we map out the links of branches until we ultimately get um, a full reconstruction of one neuron at a time. And we have different classes and levels of players who contribute in different ways. Some of them spend most of their time playing and actually mapping out the new lengths of branches and others spend their time checking over, looking over the mistakes of other players um, and then checking over these branches and in detail to make sure that nothing is missed and all these little nubby uh, extensions that are coming off are actually accurate and belong there. So all these so, cells. Amy, quick question. So are these other players live right now? Yeah, they like are. Wow, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. So this is Ashmore. She's uh, she's uh, playing from Belgium right now. Um, and then this is kind of a ticker of players who are earning points right now in the game. Um, and at right now, uh, players have spent a few years, well, many years now, working on uh, a retinal data set. But as they level up in the game, they're granted access to other data sets that are kind of hidden behind the scenes. Um, they have a lot of you know, stats about you know, how they've kind of performed. So I just did one cube, but if I just like, click our top scoring player for the day, she's done 65,000 cubes. Um, and has 99% accuracy. So we have a few hundred thousand players who have joined and there's a very tight-knit community 
of iWirers and it's really kind of an extension of our lab and it's a, a community of friends. They kind of have meetups and players themselves kind of sponsor swag for each other for competitions that we do in the game. Um, it's kind of a new and interesting way to do science and we've been working kind of behind the scenes on a couple of new games that are have much better AI than what we have in iWire um, that will make the reconstruction much faster but you know, the consequence of that is that the, the, um, the human uh, part is more difficult. So it becomes a, an interesting UI UX challenge of, you know, how do you build a website that uh, trains humans to be so expert that they're better than a pretty good AI? <laughs> and then how do they interact directly with the machine learning program? So on the scientific visualization front, one of the things that we produce is this thing called museum.iwire. Uh, so this is uh, in conjunction with a cell publication that came out. Uh, it's a catalog of lots of different ganglion cell types that were densely reconstructed from the iWire data set. Uh, so you can load up a lot of, a lot of different cells and you can also pull up uh, functional and structural data about these cells. So we have sort of interactive charts so that you can look at the 3D and you can um, load up different cells of different types to see in one interactive window. Um, that just kind of helps in identifying their structure and function. So these are bistratified cells, which I think are pretty cool. Um, let me just, let me just make this window a little big because I have a couple of a couple of cool things to show. So, yeah, uh, and beyond kind of the 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 scientific visualization front, you know, we are a citizen science project, and so we have kind of a special motive to be getting the general public excited about neuroscience because that may translate into more citizen scientists who will come and help participate in this project. So we've kind of created this uh, science.iwire.org website, which is a, a partnership with Massachusetts College of Art and Design, where we have illustration and animation students um, working on neuroscience visualization content. So, you know, if you are a neuroscience college student or graduate student, then, you know, you obviously know that neurons are connected to synapses and there's different types of neurons in the brain that have different structure and function and the action potentials get relayed and there's trillions of them every second going in the brain. But from uh, our experience uh, interacting with a lot of members of the general public, that's not all common knowledge. And so making these uh, basic facts about neuroscience more accessible, more visible, um, easy to see and absorb in kind of a simple format, uh, but also kind of drawing upon some of the 3D reconstructions to convey these facts is, is another way that we utilize visualization to kind of tell the story of neuroscience and to get people excited about how neuroscience works. Um, and then another one that I'll kind of touch on is this project we did called Zoo Brains, uh, a summer project a couple years ago, also with Mass Art. We created a series of posters that's at Zoo New England that is kind of highlighting attributes of animals' brains that are linked to special and unique behavior of those animals. So for young, uh, young kids kind of coming to the zoo, they can obviously you know, kind of observe different behaviors and different attributes of neurons, but to tie those unique elements of individual species on the earth <laughs> to uh, attributes of the nervous system is kind of a, a first step in getting curious about how differences in the brains of different animals result in different skills and abilities and, and you know physical differences in different animals and maybe starts making them think a little bit about how their brain is different than that maybe of a, of a gorilla or of a chimpanzee and maybe what elements of their own brain are contributing to the things that they think and feel. So I'll kind of pop back into this presentation um, because we've done a lot of getting neurons out into the world. So this is a, a mural, uh, we call it the, the cortex wall that was like 16 feet at, at Princeton University of um, a bunch of cortical neurons that were reconstructed from the IRPA microns data set. Um, this is a recent mural that was put in, I think just a little bit before the COVID quarantine began um, for a makerspace in, in a library for the city of Cambridge that if you look closely, there's there's all sorts of making and, and, and hacking and kind of circuits and sewing, but there's also some neurons kind of flowing out of this girl. So kind of just integrating more elements of neuroscience into everyday life, I think is sort of the path to getting more people excited about this field. Uh, and then also, you know, so we've made a lot of 3D renders and, and animations, and those have landed in places like Times Square, and we've put 
working neurons into virtual reality. So first nature circuit, uh, a, a first circuit of uh, direction selectivity cells that we published in nature. We used HTC Vive to allow visitors to paint with light. So you're sort of acting like the photon. And as you move the hand controller, you're actually triggering this circuit of neurons to fire. And then we also do you know, some kind of fun stuff, like seeing neuroscience materialize in front of your eyes, uh, seeing you know, the, the amazing kind of beautiful, whimsical world of the brain come to life in sort of a creative and unique way, I think is, is something that we don't see enough of and that there's a lot of opportunity to kind of get people you know, to start thinking a little bit differently, like not to say put your head in the clouds, but really think differently about about the brain, right? So most people growing up see that that cliche textbook representation of sort of a motor neuron, you know, you don't get to see these beautiful 3D reconstructions of cells where you can see every single spine, you know, a half of a synapse sticking off the dendrites of these excitatory cells. Um, and playing around with these models, you know, allows you to kind of have a little bit of fun with the science. And I know kind of in the day to day of doing neuroscience, it can get a little it can you can get really bogged down in the minutia, which are of course very important, but there is an opportunity through visualization to to make it like a little more infectious in you know the enthusiasm of the of the field, maybe. <laughs> Pardon my puns. <laughs> um, and and also in these visualizations to kind of elucidate important elements of the brain. So say showing the scale of going from a whole cortical column to the somas of neurons to individual synapses to help people understand, you know, why the brain is so difficult to study because it is, even though these individual cells and synapses are, are so incredibly small, the brain as a whole is a vast, you know, universe. The cosmos of, uh, of consciousness, as people say, but it, it is a wonderful, weird, and strange, and exotic place that people should be getting excited about because it is the seat of all that we are as humans. So I think uh, maybe I, I could go on and on and on. We've really done a lot of kind of outside the box uh, visualization. Um, visualization work over the years with iWire, but I just wanted to say that, you know, the work of uh, getting neuroscience out into the, the hands of the public goes beyond, you know, creating utility through tools. So, you know, visualizing, you know, 3D data and, and combining multidimensional data um, in a browser, I think is something that this field will need much more of as time goes on. And I think that's a critical area for lots of people to focus on, but also some of these more artistic and more kind of nebular, you know, experiments and things that you create that are sort of inspired by the brain can also lead to all sorts of unexpected opportunities and collaborations and maybe even creative questions and ideas. So everyone am really excited to be working in this field and to see how far it's come since you know, I started in 2012. And I'm so excited for all of you as, as college students and younger people to, to be diving in and I can't wait to see what you all will create. So thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. That's some beautiful material and it's really important. Um, my understanding is that it's super hard to do this just by automated stuff. So uh, you're, one of the key questions that people are upvoting is, are there some scientific questions that are solved by the citizen scientists that you couldn't do with just having experts? Yeah, sure. So the the point of having iWire is that the AI does this semi-automated reconstructions and it takes it, when iWire launched, which was in 2012, a long time ago now, <laughs> it used to take about a thousand hours of an expert's time to map just one neuron. Now uh, the, the newer data sets that are not iWire can be done anywhere from like 30 minutes to two hours of an expert. Um, so what the citizen scientists allow us to do is to sort of scale our reconstruction. So, you know, iWire, uh, you know, when we were publishing original papers, it would be with, you know, a few dozen neurons, which was huge at the time. Now, you know, you need thousands, well, not always, but it's great to have thousands of neurons. And so having all these people from around the world who become experts, who allow us to proofread uh, and have confidence that our reconstructions are accurate, um, allows the, the analysts at lab to uh, be able to actually 
look at the circuits of neurons and ask different questions because if we don't have you know the synaptic pairs of cells if we can't you know one-to-one -one identify the the cells that are fully reconstructed with the the cells that are imaged with two photon microscopy then you really can't be asking good questions if you don't have good reconstructions so the citizen scientists are not actually doing the analysis of the cells they're doing the proofreading and the reconstruction of the 3D neurons. And over time, we find that the, the players not only are like a part of the lab, but they become incredibly expert, like on par, maybe probably better in some cases <laughs> than, than some of the top um, professional experts. Thanks, Amy. Another question that's related to that is how do you, uh, Betsy asks, how do you convince people to spend your their time on iWire? What would you say is the motivation for them? Yeah, sure. So, you know, we utilize a lot of kind of well-known game mechanics that are used in the gaming industry. So we have the players win points. So the, the larger volume that they add within each cube gives them points uh, as long as they are adding the same volume that other accurate players did. Uh, there's a little bit of points that they earn for the time uh, that they spend reconstructing the neurons. Uh, also, there is a, sort of like a, an achievement system in iWire. So your profile, you get all sorts of badges as you level up and there's different types of activities that you can do in iWire. So there's different types of kind of profile swag that you get. Um, we also do lots of competitions in the game. So we do happy hours and team versus and these special sort of week long competitions every quarter that just make it fun and kind of switch it up. And we do like featured iWire. So we really try to make it like a community uh, instead of just you know a website that has users that come in and like do work for us because I think of it as more as they're working with us to further our goals in neuroscience. Um, and then I do think a lot of the motivation comes from you know teaming up. They become friends with the other players who spend a lot of time in the game, uh, and then knowing that you're helping neuroscience. You know you could be playing a puzzle game just for fun, or you could be solving puzzles to help further a field of neuroscience. And I think the latter is a little more compelling to to at least some people. Yeah, it's we could certainly use more cooperation in this world, and it's great that you've built a platform where people can do that for a greater good. Thank right. you so much, Amy. Uh, so you. now let's turn to Helena. Helena, do you want to share your screen or do you want to um, just speak for a bit? Oh, I need to unmike, uh, unmute you. Yes. Ah, yes. Uh, yes. Hello, everybody. Um, I am going to share a couple of pictures, but not until the end of my talk. Okay. So maybe we can let Colin be on here and feel like he's part of the group for a little bit. Yes, let's Until I do that. Uh, well, it's up to you. You're the host. Uh, yes, so anyway, hello, my name's Helena. Um, I have been working with science communications for, uh, for 14 years now, which is why Zach asked me to be on this panel. Um, I don't do visualization myself as such, but Zach has asked me to talk a little bit about um, like how do you communicate science using uh, visual imagery, basically. Um, and um, I really enjoyed Amy's talk because citizen science is one of my favorite ways of communicating science because it is a very nice way of engaging the public uh, in the scientific method. And like Zach said, I think we can all agree that that is something that is needed in the world at this point in time. Um, for There's other reasons, of course, to, to communicate science than just to sort of engage the public. Um, for scientists themselves, um, I mean, you. I mean, I'm just assuming that the people in the audience here are scientists at various levels, mostly students. I'm guessing. Um, and the reason why you guys share your science is, is to push science faster and further, right? You want to share your results with other scientists so that they can build on to their own research or confirm their own research or realize that, oops, they got different results than me. Um, I should probably check mine or talk to them about what they did different. Um, some other reasons to communicate science is, of course, to educate people, um, the public uh, and children, you know, in the school and things like that. And then another um, reason, uh, which Amy has also touched upon already, is to raise awareness, uh, to promote science, to uh, advocate the science that is being done. Um, and the reason we're doing this is because, you know, science help 
people live better lives in, in all aspects from, from health to environment uh, and all kinds of other things. It helps inform policy. Uh, it helps you make better decisions regarding, you know, your health and, and other things. Um, and there's many ways that you can communicate science, of course. Um, what I'm going to focus on here, again, is the visual uh, component of communicating science. And I have like a, a long list of different things and they range from very sort of general to fairly specific. And I'm just gonna sort of play it by ear a little bit and see how far I get uh, before my time is up. Um, when it comes to, to visual media, this is something that you can use, of course, in a lot of channels and a lot of modalities when it comes to science communication. You can produce videos uh, you can use your imagery on social media, uh, and you can do science art, which is a little bit of what Amy touched upon, but also what Colin is going to talk about uh, after me. Um, there's different kinds of science art. Uh, I'm really excited to hear Colin talk about his. I got a glimpse of it the other day when we did our pre-meeting. Um, but there's different kinds of, of science art. There's wall art. You can hang it on your wall. It looks pretty and it's informative. Uh, there's wearable art, which I'm a big fan of, uh, which is a great way to raise awareness uh, and to do advocacy for science. Um, there's any number of artists over the world who does neuroscience wearable art, uh, right? See, Zach's great shirt there with a brain on it. Um, there are people who make scarves and ties and jewelry and, and skirts and dresses and all kinds of great wearable art that, that you can buy. And I don't know, maybe this is something that we can put in the, you know, recommended further reading session or section if we get one of those put up. Um, I'm not gonna show any examples of this right now uh, because I wanna talk a little bit about um, maybe not so much the actual image itself, itself, but what you do with it in, in your science communication. And considering that we have a lot of students here, um, I'm trying to think of my target audience here, which is like a key thing that you need to do when you communicate your science. Uh, so I think I'm going to like briefly touch upon how to make a good poster. Uh, and how to um, communicate a little bit with the public about your science. Uh, when it comes to, to like general scientific communication principles or communication principles overall, not specific to science, um, good communication is when you connect with your audience. Exactly, know your audience, the Neuromatch organizers said in the chat. Um, you really need to know who you're talking to um, in order to know what they want to know. Because no matter how well you have crafted your message, it is never going to be heard the same way by all of the people that you're talking to. It doesn't matter if they use the same words and the same intonation and the same language and the same imagery or whatever else. People are going to interpret it differently because people are different. Um, so you need to be flexible when you communicate your science in order, in addition to thinking about who you're talking to. And like if you, if you think about it, communicating science or communicating anything is a little bit like selling something because that's really what you're doing. Like you're trying to sell the idea of something or, or a concept to somebody because you think that they will have use of it. They might not know how they are going to benefit from knowing or accepting the message that you're trying to give them. So it's up to you to sort of figure out the best way of how to convince them of that. And I mean, this is something really that uh, most people are doing on a daily, in their daily lives already without even knowing it. And we've been trained for this since we were little kids, right? Because like when you were a little kid, you learned pretty quickly that because I want to was not the best way to convince your parents that you should be able to do something or have something, 
right? You pretty quickly learned that what the proper selling arguments were, like, but I cleaned my room, I did my homework, you know, that kind of stuff. And this is something that we still do even when we're grown up, right? I mean, we're constantly trying to sell in concepts or best way of doing things with our families, our partners, our coworkers, whoever you're interacting with on a daily basis. And this is just something that you need to fine tune more when you're doing your science communication. You really need to consider your target group, like who am I trying to sell my science to and what will they get out of it? And how can I convince them that they will actually benefit from learning what I'm talking about or from accepting this science that I am trying to teach them? So communication is really a lot more listening than talking a lot of the time. I'm saying sitting here talking at you, but anyway, uh, <laughs> I realize the irony. Um, so, and I mean, I've, so in my job, I'm, I'm the director of development and communications at INCF. And what we do is that we, uh, we try to promote and facilitate open neuroscience by the de developing uh, standards and best practices and by training people in how to implement those standards and best practices in their research. So I spend a lot of my time on video calls uh, with people who have heard of us and they're interested, but they're not quite convinced that they should join us because we're a membership organizations, uh, organization and we are open for both companies and organizations and academic institutions and people, individuals, to join us and help us in this, in this work. And I have a lot of calls with representatives from companies and, and institutions because they have questions like, how is this really gonna benefit us if we join INCF and join sort of the movement towards open neuroscience? And it, it strikes me every time, even though I, of course, I have my standard pitch, right? And I have like, a different one for companies and a different one for academic institutions. But still, even though I have done this so many times, it's it's different. It's very different. Like the first five minutes usually go the same, but then I have to start listening. And then I realize every time that, wow, they have really understood this in a completely different way, not wrong, but just like a different way. And I constantly have to modify my message, constantly have to modify how I tell them the same thing as I've told everybody else. Uh, and this is a really useful learning experience for me anyway to, to be doing this because it really helps me consi consider that when, when I communicate what INCF does and, and other kinds of science that I communicate because I think it's necessary and fun. Um, but it's really that two-way com communication that is super important to consider when you're uh, communicating your science. And um, yeah, so that, that's sort of like the basis of any kind of communications. You have to listen, you have to constantly reevaluate what you're saying and modify that message. And it's fairly easy to, to tell, at least if you're talking to people face to face, to see if they're kind of, you know, if they're logged out or if they're interested. So that's sort of that's my main message here. You have to be in tune with your audience and you have to really understand and be mindful of how they are hearing what you're saying. I see I, time is ticking on, so I'm just gonna say some very quick sort of hands-on tips when it comes to um, using your, uh, or visualizing your data, your science into, for example, posters just like very quickly. There's, I can really recommend um, a blog called Better Posters. If you Google Better Posters, it's the first thing that comes up. It's by Zen Fox. It's super useful if you're sort of in the poster making business, which if you're a grad student, then I'm sorry, but you're gonna have to make a lot of posters. Um, when, you, when you make posters, you need to use imagery because nobody wants to stand by a poster and read like columns of text. It's not useful because nobody's gonna do it and nobody's gonna get the gist of that because we all know at poster sessions, you know, time is short. So you wanna use minimal text. You wanna be very uh, mindful of what kind of, of how you visualize your data. Like 
big tables with a lot of numbers, not useful either. Try to put it in a graph, in a, in a chart of some kind. There are some great online resources of what kind of chart you should use for different kinds of data, depending on what you want to show. This is also Googleable. Please, please do that. Um, think about your titles. The titles should be like the gist of the content of your poster. It should be short. It should not have a bunch of fancy words. It should be minimal text and, and very readable and understandable. Don't put too much stuff on your poster. Like white space should be there just for the sake of readability. Uh, try to use some kind of grid on your poster, like a two or four square grid or three columns or something like that. Again, all of this is available on Better Posters. I cannot recommend this blog enough. Uh, some of the key things to consider also are, like, it's really only four things that you should consider when you make your poster. When it comes to the actual technical stuff, you should consider your typography. Like most people nowadays use a sans serif font. Do that much more easily read, read than uh, serif fonts. Use clarity in your speech. Again, no long sentences, no fancy words, no extra words, just like use the words that describe your science. Consider the colors that you're using. It should be, first of all, it should be consistent over your poster. It should not be too many colors. A couple of different highlight colors is enough. Otherwise, again, it's gonna be hard to read. Also consider accessibility for people who have visual impairments, like consider red, green, uh, color blindness and, and other things. There are guides for this on the internet as well. When you use images like photos and clip art and stock photos and things like that, you have to consider permissions. You have to make sure that you are allowed to use it if you're using somebody else's photo on your poster or your layout, your presentation, whatever it may be. Um, on a more sort of personal level, when you make any kind of poster or, or graphic or uh, layout, um, try to tell a story. And this again comes back to the sort of uh, relatability and what target group that you're talking about. Because if you can tell a, a scientific story that people can relate to, they're much more likely to remember it and to sort of accept it. And also don't be afraid to be funny. Like humor is a good thing. If you can sneak a pun in there, uh, do so. I know uh, there's been a trend over the last few years for people to like make funny, punny titles of their scientific papers. And why not? It, gets them the extra attention. So I think that's a good thing. And I'm pretty sure that my time is up. <laughs> yeah, you, I, it would be good to move on to Colin yeah. so we can have some time for a group discussion as well. Um, so thank you very much. I mean, I think all of the points that you just raised are things that I repeatedly tell um, the students in my lab. And often, you know, you go to a poster session and you don't see people doing these things. So it's great to have that reiterated. Um, and for, especially from an expert who sees a lot of these things and knows what works and what doesn't work. So thanks for the link also. Um, I'd like to bring Colin up on stage now. And let's see, I do that this way. And thank you once again, Helena. And we'll talk more with you soon. Hey everybody. Uh, my name's, am I, you guys can hear me, right? Okay, great. Uh, my name is Colin Prawl. Yes, I'm an artist. I live in New York City. Um, I've been painting my whole life. I've been interested in the sciences since I was really young. Um, I got a degree in illustration from Rhode Island School of Design about eight years ago. And that academic track gave me a lot of skills as far as painting go, but there was kind of a lapse in the amount of information that I got about how vision works, how it might apply to art, and how the whole system functions of the brain are even laid out at all. I got absolutely no information about that. That may have been the track that I specifically took, but uh, so a couple of years after I graduated, I 
had all these questions about art at a kind of fundamental, maybe metaphysical level, as far as where inspiration comes from, how we see and this and that. And I had no real leads as far as where to go in finding that information out. So I basically just uh, started listening to YouTube videos and reading random books that I found at the Strand and through a very long and arduous process of trying to figure out how to uh, organize this information without some sort of rigid system, I was able to get enough information coming together to sort of uh, visualize how to turn the visual system into a entire map that I could then communicate through my social media platforms. So I'll just uh, share my screen here. Okay, I need someone to, I've got too many video sources here, so. Okay, so I'm gonna boot Amy. Bye, Bye Amy, we'll see you in a bit. All right. Okay, so. Can you guys see this? Uh, it's coming up right. now. I'll start with the vision. Let's see, Let's see here. That's there we go. Yes. So this is the visual system with all of the keyed out areas on it. I'll pull up the other uh, diagram without them, and I can kind of run through uh, what's going on here. Let's see. Ah, there we go. Okay, so. So this this is your painting here, right? This is a this, painting. How, how big is it? It's uh, 46 by 66 inches. So uh, in metric, like 1.2 by, I don't know, 1.8 meters, Very something detailed. like that. Yeah, so I can zoom in here and kind of show you the layout from back to front. So vision is based on mapping reflectances and depth cues and the entirety of the 3D world around us based on what comes in through our eyes mostly and partly from other inputs from uh, other sensory systems that gets mixed together. So here we have just light information as photons which enter in through the eyes on one end and on this half of the diagram here, basically you have a lot of basic information about maybe early visual streams. So like on the left side, there's the light information coming through and our retina has the photoreceptors on the back end. So this is a rough layout of rod and cone cells going through to horizontal bipolar cells, amacrine cells to the ganglion uh, layer. And here would be a map of how colorblind individuals would see different shades depending on which deficiency in cones they have. Um, the oculomotor system, uh, frontal eye fields involved with saccadic eye movement, uh, the blind spot and visual acuity, the layers of stacks of different retinal uh, processing layers, that's kind of like all the inputs that the work that Amy's doing would might end up somewhere in the sandwich here. Uh, opponent processing going on here, uh, the evolution of the eye, um, directional orientation cells and their spike counts in V1 and certain cortical columns. Uh, so then the optic track goes back into the lateral geniculate here and passes through to V1 with a bridge to the superior colliculus, the optic tectum, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And then this half back here, basically it's like if you have the whole brain flipped open, then this would be the cortical regions. So going along the outside, it's sort of symmetrical with the right and left hemisphere. You have the ventral visual stream, which is involved with uh, more or less identification of objects, 
and you have the motor or uh, visual um, motion area over here, and then the dorsal stream perhaps going this way with the somatosensory homunculus uh, interacting its hand with what it sees with its eye, and then all of this visual information gets kind of blended together and turned into the visual output that we would then experience as the world around us in this corner over here. So then you have the kind of like an optical illusion garden on one side, optical illusions being a good gateway into studying uh, the visual system and how and why certain things that act the way that they do. Uh, a more accurate anatomical map of how the visual stream goes into the thalamus, back to the cortex, and then the dual stream processes going on here. And then on this side, it's just kind of like a clinical general overview of uh, neuroanatomy going from the entire nervous system here to a slice of the brain here, going in towards the cortex with some white matter the different layers of the cortex segmented into individual neurons and then an individual synapse. And then finally over here, the uh, ion channels and G protein receptors going on. And then up here, uh, differentiation of uh, neural stem cells into different neurons, uh, schematics of network types, the evolution of the brain going from fish to primates more or less. And, then the development of the brain from infant to adult. And then over here would be a little periodic table of uh, neurotransmitters and uh, associated uh, drugs and psychoactives that are related in structure. So this was one that I did in 2017, just about three years ago. And considering the fact that I feel like it was a good jumping off point into doing other systems of sensory information, let me see if I can pull up the auditory system and just give a brief rundown of that too. How long did that take to, to paint uh, on the to audience paint, wants to know? I'd say three months, but it was about, um, two years of research going ahead of time. Um, sorry. And if you're entirely self-taught in neuroscience. Yeah. Okay, that's not it. One second. Wow. Um, I've, been, um, I've been looking for a schematic of the brain that has these kind of functions in it and labeled and anatomical stuff, but this is such a beautiful parallel Right. I can actually, I'll pull up the, these are the, the original images that I found that inspired me to be able to do it. So this is from uh, the computational brain by uh, Terry Sajnowski and Patricia Churchland. And this was the first image I think that I saw where it was like, oh, these are all kind of individual segmented areas and there are specific tracks that go into the different layers that can more or less be decoded rather than just assuming that the brain is a giant blob of lumpy gel that nobody has any idea what's going on. Um, and then this would be another one that's a, a much more sparse version of the same thing. Um, here's one from the uh, Al Haytham from a thousand years ago. This is like the first real scientific illustration of the optic chiasm and the optic tracks going back into the brain. He was one of the first to consider that uh, light goes into the eyes rather than let information being exuded outwards, which is what the ancient Greeks thought. And then here's one from Fritz Kahn from the 1920s. So it's the whole visual tract of a man looking at a railway station, but it kind of has the same uh, layout of the optic chiasm and going back in the cortex. So different things where I was like, let's take this kind of map layout and visualize it in a more kind of modern video game-esque multicolored kind of fantasy world. And so that's 
where the visual system went and then the auditory system just briefly um, it's the same kind of thing going on just so you have sound inf information coming in around the individual there's a little corner with the physics of sound kind of graphed out uh, this is the development of the speech of speech in children which is kind of diagrammed as far as years and uh, how they uh, turn symbols and sounds into grammar. Um, so then you have the ears going in through the uh, ear canal, transduced through the ear bones to the cochlea here. Um, this is all how the cochlea looks when it's unwound with the op or auditory nerve going out, uh, the auditory nerve going into the auditory brainstem. So this is the cochlear nucleus going in here, the trapezoidal bodies, the uh, superior olivary complex, the center areas, uh, kind of the 3D auditory world that we pull together through cross correlations of the two auditory inputs from either side, um, going on to the inferior colliculus. And then those go out to either side to the auditory cortex uh, would be here and then it kind of has a uh, tonotopic mapping. And then all these smaller diagrams, I don't remember exactly the specifics of each graph here, but basically I use the notion of uh, lateralization to have speech processing information going on on the left side and then music and melody of speech information going on on the right side. Um, right. Again, over here is kind of another uh, more anatomically precise map of the auditory tract going to cortex and then how it uh, centers. Um, little amazing. map of language. So Colin, language. we yeah. should, there's so much more to dig in here. I know. <laughs> and and this this stuff is available to look at on your website, right? So people It can is. If you go to colorprawl.com, it's there. Uh, yeah, I posted the link and and you're reprinting these as well, right? So people can can purchase them for your wall. Yeah, if you go to colorprawl.bigcartel.com, you can order prints there and what I'm actually going to do is uh I'll put in a discount code so if you type in neuro at any URO, you can get 25% off if you watch this video. Wow, that's very generous. Yeah. So, awesome. um, you. You can get so I want to I want to leave time for all of us to discuss together. So let me bring sure. Amy back up. Um, and we'll go a little bit over uh, if that's OK with um, people in the at the unmute you, Helena. Let's see. OK, let's bring Amy back on screen. And that is just phenomenal work. Uh, Thanks. I think you've muted yourself, Zach. Zach seemed to have a technical issue. So do we still have Amy? Because I don't see Amy in my window. All right, please stand by while we have some technical difficulties. So Colin, that is a really amazing picture. I would have assumed that it would have taken you a lot longer to paint that. Uh, what did you say, four months? 
Yeah, it was about four months because basically if you have the thing sketched out with all of the, if you make a list of all the things that you want to include and you lay them out in a way that everything's more or less organized, the actual painting process doesn't take as long as finding out what needs to go in and what doesn't. Okay. It's again, like what you said with the poster organization, it's all about, you know, finding the best uh, mix of information to use. And then the painting process is just, you know, labor at that point, so. I mean, the audience is proposing that you do a video series where you talk through uh, your painting there. I think that would be yeah. super fun. Uh, if, yeah, if you I want, can... I'd be happy to, uh, to help facilitate that if you're interested. Yeah, let's, we can do it for sure. I'll have a more organized script rather than trying to, you know, fumble through remembering what I put on there two years ago and haven't thought about it since then. That would be great. Uh, Helena, when you when you see something like this, do you feel like this is something that could uh, help bring people into neuroscience and make them feel like they could uh, could participate? Or I mean, what you look at it, it's just so huge. The all, other reaction might be like, "Oh, I can't even approach that." But it, so you need to no, have. No, I think it's like in its in the right sort of venue, I think that's a fantastic way of people to just sort of dive in and start at some level. Because like, how big is the sort of like if you printed this full size, how big would it be? Uh, just under five feet by three and a half, I think. Right. Yeah. So it's it's huge, right? So it's a really great thing for people to just stand in front of and just start somewhere and then just sort of move around the picture and really get excited about stuff and like i really see how people's interests could be piqued yeah. by sort of going through this painting in detail yeah basically what i've been doing is just uh taking a small caption about one little area and then posting it on to whatever social media accounts i've got like instagram and facebook and then you know a lot of the people that are there are, i usually don't do neuroscience related art it's just paintings that are completely unrelated so then anyone that's following just gets a dose of that information whether they like it or not so it's just kind of like uh, you know giving neuroscience information to an audience that didn't necessarily sign up for it which i think you know there people are surprised at like oh wow that's interesting and i never really even considered you know that that was uh something to look into so Right, but that's what's genius about it because it's a huge thing that's visually very pleasing, right? And if they're not sort of forewarned that it's neuroscience and then you start looking at it, it's like, oh, there's a brain and oh my God, that looks like, you know, eyes and then there's some little diagrams. Like it is a really good way to sort of spark an interest. I yeah, think. for sure. Thank you. So Zach, look like you've muted yourself again. Amy, I've got a question. Um, yeah. Does the human end of the uh, drawing process in any way help entrain the machine learning end of that uh, neuron mapping? Yeah, not right now. We actually opted for just building new machine learning from scratch instead of integrating in the, the work from the iWirus because they're the, there's a kind of untraditional staining technique that was used on the iWire data set that's not that common. So now the newer data sets have ground truthing that's done by paid experts. Mm -hmm. And we've also we had a lot of discussions in lab as to whether we should try to crowdsource the ground truth. Um, but our thoughts are kind of that iWire is very 3D and ground truthing is like painting in 2D layer after la slice after slice after slice and it's very tedious. Um, and so we kind of opted to just have the tracers do that um, because also when you're doing ground truthing, it's like kind of needed to be done pretty quickly and we didn't want to be like pushing the players to do something that we thought was pretty boring. Yeah. <laughs> To do it on like come on get it get it for this this uh, timeline we gotta get it done so yeah no but that is a common question and it's mm -hmm. it definitely something that was considered yeah so amy there's a couple of other questions regarding iwire in the kind of come in 
Where did oh, the audience. I must have, I yeah. must not see the questions. Like if you click the ask a question. Oh, wow, sorry. And pop, <laughs> pop those yeah. open, then there's a couple in there. Okay, yeah, how many neurons has iWire built? I think by last count it was like over 3,000 uh, cells in iWire, which may not sound like a lot, but that's a lot. Um, in the beginning of iWire, it was like a huge deal. We were trying to map one neuron in one week. And we were like, there's no way we can do that. It takes so long to do. And the game was a lot less efficient back then. And we managed to do it and we were like, so excited. Now we, we complete like one to two cells a day. Um, and there's another kind of data set that's from the zebrafish hindbrain in, um, that's in kind of like a locked version of iWire that only the, the, the elite power players are able to do. And I think they've mapped like two or 3,000 additional cells because they have a, an improved uh, reconstruction um, algorithm that they use. Yeah, and then also what different neurons uh, slash areas slash species does iWire host? So right now we have mouse retina in iWire and we also have um, from the zebrafish hindbrain, which is sort of like similar to cerebellum. Um, and we're working on a new uh, project for a whole fly brain that will map like 100,000 neurons. And then we're working on another project that will be mouse cortex that will be another 100,000 neurons. And those are kind of unreleased and if any of the, um, images and like animations I showed that like the cortical columns from mouse cortex, any of the cells that have spines, um, the little things that are projecting, sticking off neurons, those are all from uh, cortex cells instead of retinal cells. So I'm, I'm curious, can you hear me again? Mm -hmm. My computer has stopped melting, I suppose. Um, Colin, when you, when you look at some of those 3D reconstructions and the, the complexity there, does it evoke any ideas how to how to interact with that in a in a new way? I, I ask because, like, we actually work with uh, Sebastian and and Iwire's group because we're involved in getting this two petabyte set of data with a hundred thousand neurons as well, and we found it's re it's amazing data set historic data set. I didn't have anything to do with collecting it, but you know the people at uh, Andreas's Andreas Tolius's lab and the Allen Institute and Sebastian's lab have done this incredible stuff. But now using the data is incredibly hard because it's so intricate and having good ways of visualizing it is really important. And when you have a dense reconstruction where like the, the neurons that you see there, you're, Amy, you showed them as really nicely separated. But when you look at the full tissue, there's no blank space. It's, it's like chaos. <laughs> And so how to actually like get your head around that so that you can start to use your visual system to process that is a major challenge. Yeah. If anybody has any ideas, that's really helpful for the field. Well, a lot of the, the, the kind of pop science uh, TV shows use those animations of the neurons firing at each other and they're just kind of floating in space. And that's kind of a terrible way to visualize what's actually going on whereas the neurons are actually kind of like densely packed but then again you're not really going to be able to get kind of that cool fly through uh action shot in your pbs special if you have like this dense chunk of neurons that you're flipping through um so oh, we lost it again um but yeah i don't know i don't have much experience with uh 3d mod modeling or interactive computer software so uh, turning that information into something that I would find uh, easy to navigate. I'm not really sure exactly. I'll have to go onto iWire and uh, play play around a bit and see what's going on. Um, but I have a lot of I thought, it was really cool. So I'll jump in because I do have a lot of experience in that, and I've thought quite a lot about what we need in this this program called NeuroGlancer that Google has built. Um, we've been doing a lot of kind of UI and the back end for that uh, in order to make it a lot more usable for a broader scientific community and for people who aren't already using it. You know, scientific software is not really known for being super easy to use from the get go. So we're kind of starting with that. But um, we've also been thinking about how you could use skeletons inside the cells uh, as a way that you could kind of animate uh, active potentials moving through them. 
um, and having, so right now in the visualization tool, you kind of click on a mesh and it loads up a 3D neuron and you can load lots of different 3D neurons and like manually recolor them, but you can't really, you can't really group them or classify them or like toggle which ones you see. So I would kind of imagine this platform where, you know, if you are trying to navigate through 100,000 somas within a, that are tightly packed in a single volume, um, being able to group the cells by type, by type or, or other attributes and kind of uh, playing around with the opacity and being able to pull up the presynaptic or postsynaptic partners, recoloring them accordingly, simulating activity through those neurons, um, and then being able to share those links with animations in browser with your collaborators, I think it's going to be a totally transformative thing for this field of connectomics. And it's not even just a pipe dream anymore. Like before we built museum.iwire, that was kind of, I pushed so hard for that to be built. And initially it was like, nah, we don't need that. You know, do we really want to devote the development time to, to build that? And, and now the idea of what we're going to be able to do with this cubic millimeter, um, you know, all these neurons from mouse cortex and, and having kind of a lot of years of design experience behind it, I think that is just going to completely change how we figure out what questions to ask. Because it's just, it's just too much to keep in your mind when you start to look at how complex some of these cells are and how many synaptic partners, you know, when you're having thousands of <laughs> synaptic partners on individual cells, like you can't even, it's just hard to even process to, to even begin to think about. So the visual element, I think, is going to be critical. Thank you so much. Uh-oh, Zach, we can't hear you again. I wonder why that keeps happening. <laughs> we'll do Mystery Science Theater 3000. And yeah, what's Zach saying right now? We'll figure Zach, it out. Zach, you just move your mouth and we'll narrate for you. <laughs> okay, he has to say bye now. Okay, well. All right. Should we say bye, I guess? I guess so, yeah. I mean, well, we're, we're, well, we may do this one more time. time so. This will be rebroadcast. I'm not sure exactly what the, the plan is, but uh, yeah, this is great. Uh, thanks, both of you. Um, yes. for yeah, thanks. This was, this was a lot of fun. And thanks to everybody who tuned in. Oh, Zach no, is yes, back. Indeed. OK, thanks for closing it out for us. <laughs> I would love to continue this conversation. Evidently, my computer doesn't want to. Oh, there he goes again. <laughs> I was going to one last question I saw about iWire. We do have the players uh, co-authors on our papers. So we have a long list of authors on our publication. All right. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.